Hello everyone. Welcome to the second programme in my series, Bob's Golden Memories, and I expect there'll be a lot more to come. And on this one, I'm going to take you way back to 1986, and it was the Whitbread UK Championships. It was a competition, a four day competition, but the days were split every Wednesday during the summer, there were four Wednesdays over four different venues. So quite, a, well, there was a, ve a variety of venues, but the, the anglers, you know, there were some brilliant anglers fishing it. Before I go to that though, I'll just show you an early picture. This is, this was my real early days of, of match fishing. If I'll take you back to the, it was sort of late seventies, that one. But that was my first success really at match fishing fishing for Marconi's, a Marconi club. Now, you see that, that young lad, good looking lad right at the front with, with an Elvis Presley quiff. Well, that's me hanging on to that trophy. Well, that's me. And then sort of just behind me at the back is Peter Clapton, my good friend, Peter. Professor, looks a bit like a professor, look. He was an extrovert then and he still is now. So that's Peter. That was, that was my first success at, at, at team fishing. But this this one was well, it was it was a who's who of, of of match anglers really, except for me. Although I'd been picked for the England team in '84, so Dick must have thought I was 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 half good. But I wasn't that experienced at fishing stick float, particularly stick float and waggler. Although I was brought up on it, not as much as as some of the good Barnsley and, and the Trent anglers. There was, I mean, from Barnsley there was Tommy Pickering. Brilliant angler, Dennis White. Dick Clegg was fishing, Richard Clegg, the England team manager he was fishing. John Allerton, Keith Hobson. They had all, all the best anglers. Alan Scotthorn. And uh, oh, going back that far, Alan Scotthorn. How old was he? he? He must have been, he was under 20 then, I think. He must have been, probably wearing short trousers, I don't know. But he was a brilliant angler then, and he still is. And then from Nottingham, we had Frank Barlow, my good friend Frank, who sadly passed away a few years ago, but we were really good friends, Frank and myself. Wayne Swinsco, just, it was never ending, the, the names of anglers. And really, I honestly think I was a bit of an, well, I was definitely an underdog and definitely not as well known as, as most of them. And the match, the first match was on the River Witham. And I went up practicing. And then the river with them is, is one of the rivers that, that flows into the wash, into the North Sea. Not not far from where I live now, really. It's sort of, it's uh, a fairly, in the winter it can flow hard, but in the summer, not too much flow. So it, it's, it's a, a reasonable summer venue, except there wasn't many fish in it. And I went up practicing the, the night before and there wasn't many fish, and I found that the only fish that I could catch were eels. Now, I, I'm not even sure whether eels are fish or not, but they do count in matches. So I was fishing for these eels on the pole, about 10 metres out, loose feeding maggots. And I was getting bites, really fast bites. It was whizzing under, and I couldn't hit anything. I just, and, and, the, and the more bites I missed, the, the more I fed. And honestly, I could not hit a bite. It, obviously, the fish were coming up in the water, and I, they've got quite small mouths, eels, haven't they? And they were just probably must have just been getting hold of the end of the maggot. They must have been crafty with the eels, river with the eels, and whizzing just just and, and sort of letting go as soon as they felt any resistance. And I, I was frustrated without a doubt. And, and Wayne Swinco came. Wayne Swinsco came along. Now. We were, I knew Wayne fairly well. I wouldn't say that we were good friends, but we knew each other to talk to and chat to. And uh, he, uh, it was very good of what he did that, that, that. We were going to fish the same match the next day. And he, and he said to me, Bobby said, you, you're feeding far too heavy. He said, cut that right back. He said, feed it as, as if you're fishing just for a few roach, half a dozen maggots, a few more, no more, he said. Um, and I thought then, you know what? In fact, since then, I, I, I found that from from then we really bonded 
as two people and we shared in, and from then to now we share information always and still talk to each other on the phone but i thought that was that was a real nice gesture to tell somebody who not as if we traveled together everywhere and which you would do if you travel with somebody you chat away don't you but he didn't have to tell me and he told me and you know i really thought a lot of him after that well i thought a lot of him anyway but do, do you know what i mean in a tactical sense so match day comes and i'm fishing let me show you let's have a look there i'll show you my oh there's a picture now 1986 was my first sponsorship deal with Browning. And that's, see that what I'm wearing? It's a Browning t-shirt. Well, that's what I got. That was my first year's sponsorship was a Browning t-shirt. Thought I'd show you that one. So I'm fishing for these, uh, so I've got set up ready to fish for these eels. And, and I thought, oh, well, you know, Wayne's told me how to fish for them. So the match starts. Now eels are, are, are a, a bit like perch, they don't really like ground bait. Definitely don't like ground bait. So you, it's better if you can loose feed or if you can cup in chop worm or cup in raw maggots or cup in casters. Much better to catch eels like that, isn't it? Sometimes we have to fish for them in winter leagues. But we didn't, we didn't have any pole cups in them days. So you would probably have to put it in some sort of lean and throw it in. But I just was loose feeding anyway. That's how I started off with a little, there's my rig. I went back and looked at the rig that I used and I could not believe that I fished so fine. You won't see it on this diagram, but I'll explain a little bit about it. There's a diagram of what I fished. And I was using, the main line is 0.09. The hook length is 0.06 or 0, probably 06, I think it is. And I had a 0.4 of a gram float. It was 12 foot deep, so 0.4 of a gram. I was using a, a, a float from Milo Colombo, famous Italian angler. I was good friends with him then, in, back in those days. Still am. And he'd given me these papyrus floats. Now, papyrus is more buoyant than balsa, so you've got a smaller float for the size. If you looked at the body of the float and compared it to a balsa float, it was smaller. So, of course, it's a good... Good sign. I think it had a cane bristle, so a reasonable bristle. Probably a cane cane stem as well, I think, on that. And these eels were quite hard to catch, so you had to fish over depth for them. Even when I was fishing the night before, I was still fishing over depth. With about, I'm guessing, the tail was about two and a half foot, three quarters of a metre to the hook length before I, I had a shot. And then just some small shots, probably number 10s or 11s. And a little and a little bulk because only 0.4 of a gram so i probably had a few looks like i had a little tiny bulk of shot together or a little olivet can't remember going back that far and with a 22 hook nip the barb off the hook because you don't need you don't need a barb with um when you're fishing for eels you know once you've hooked them the hook doesn't come out and you need to unhook them because they are hard to unhook and i hey i developed this uh i developed this i've got this way of, of, of treating eels. You know when eels come in, even when you net them, you can't get hold of them, can you? You can't, you, you go go to net them and then you're grabbing hold of them in the net. So I've got, I had a big bowl of dry ground bait, just dry brown crumb. So I got, so when I hooked the fish, I was coming in with the fish, net it, must have netted it, yeah. The, the, the eels, I, 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 ended up, I ended up catching, I must have caught about, seven pounds so seven or eight pound four and probably 20 or 30 probably 30 eels so and i was i was netting them dropping them straight in this dry bowl of ground bait i tell you what they were so easy to pick up and you just grab hold of them and you can unhook and and you're out and of course speed did matter in this case you had to catch them quickly so i'm catching these these eels the match starts and i'm going and just loose feeding just what wayne told me so, I thought, lovely, and laying a load of line on bottom and really waiting, but I've got a proper bite, not that quickly and not millions of bites. We're just laying it on over, well over depth. I'm guessing I would have had probably nearly two foot of line laying on the bottom. Then, then, then the actual bottom shot and, and a little bit further up the Olivet. 0.4 of a gram in 12 foot of water, so a very light float, really. 
But summertime, the Witham doesn't flow. There's hardly any water around, and it was just a gent. I don't even know if it was moving. Don't think it was. And eels love the warmth, don't they? When it was a hot day, and the eels love it. The, the warmer it is, the more eels feed. The, the higher the temperature of the water comes up, they love it. I was catching these eels fairly well, and in, into that big bowl of crumb, unhooking, and I had a brilliant match, really, uh, up against all these these brilliant anglers from from Barnsley from the Trent and I finished up winning the section with seven pound something of eels three and a half kilo of eels which was a good weight really I, I battered the section to be truthful but I'd found they were the only fish to, to actually fish for and guess who won the match Alan Scott on now I don't even think he was 20 I will call, give him a call and ask him how old he was that day he remember it. He had 12 or 13 pound of skimmers on the tip. So a brilliant result, brilliant angler even then, wasn't he? But that was great. Now this this UK Championships, there was 60 fishing, so six sections, and, and 10 in a section, so six sections of, of 10 anglers. And the 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 winning prize was 5,000 pounds to the over the four days, but over the four days the total total weight. And plus you got money for overalls as well. So it was a lot of money to be won. That was the, well, it was the best match on the calendar. You couldn't win any other festivals that there was none of them to compare with it for money. And uh, so there I was, I'd won my section and Alan obviously won his section first and second. I was second in the match, Alan had won it. And I was quite happy. So we were on to the next venue the following week and people were, Honestly, we had to travel miles. Not not me so bad, because I lived in the middle of the country, but, but some anglers would tra must have been travelling 300 miles. I'm trying to think how far Kevin would have would have travelled on some of them. But the second match was, was on a lake, which I considered my home venue. It was a, a lake. It was at Portsmouth. The, the venue was, it was called HMS Dryad. It was a naval base with a lake inside. It wasn't on a ship or anything, but it was a long, long, narrow lake. A bit like a river, really, probably, I don't know, 80 metres wide. So a wide, a wide river, but they pegged both sides, so 30 anglers each side. You really wanted to be somewhere in the middle of the lake with the best, because it was slightly wider there, so a bit more room for the fish. And as you got down to the ends, it got a bit narrower and there was less chance of drawing fish. But I, luckily, I was brought up on them, and this was before commercial fisheries. There was Willow Park and Gold Valley, and but nothing like the commercial fisheries or the techniques that we use today for catching carp. Nobody knew anything. But I'd been brought up at, at uh, a lake near Colchester. It was called Layer Pits. And there'd been a carp explosion in the late 70s, early 80s. And that's where my match fishing began there, really. And so I was used to, to how to feed for these carp. And as they grew, there was different techniques. And, you know, two and three pounders, four pounders. We'd found out that you fished, if you fished a... And it was quite a, quite a deep venue there, layer pitch. It was probably 12 or 14 foot deep. But the best way to catch these carp was to use a, a big waggler. I mean a big one, probably a 30 gram waggler, something like that. Something that you could tighten up to and chuck out a fair way. And about, oh, I don't know, probably about eight or 10 foot tail. You know, really just, just a long tail with nothing on it. Just a small hook, a 20 hook, two floating maggots. And then all you did was you just set your rod to an angle and all you did was just keep firing balls at this float uh, with a, a few, um, quite a few casters in it because that was the best best bait to put in. It didn't move much. But firing these balls out, firing, and then suddenly the tip would just go round as a carp took these two floating maggots off the top. And uh, that, that was easy. But I found out all you had to do was feed. And this dryad was like that. And I'd won a festival at Dryad. I'd won lots of matches there. So 100 miles from my home, but it was my home venue. I knew everything about it. But there, Dryad was a bit different. It was only shallow, 1.3 metres deep, perhaps 1.4. You couldn't cast out very far because you've got anglers either side. So if you went 35 metres, 
you know, that would be as far as you'd want to go. But you could just throw a, like a, a half ounce bomb, probably a very light line, two pound real line. We used Maxima back, back in those days. It was probably, I didn't, I didn't mic up two pound Maxima, but it was probably 0.16, it may have even been 0.18 in diameter. And then, but you use a normal hook length, or like a pound hook length, something like that, fairly light, and a 20, 20 hook, I should think. And I'd, all I fished was a, a, a light, let me shift up and show you, I've got one here, which I've done up. I just fished, now that is, you can't really see it, can you, because it's against my black. Yeah, it's against my black. I wonder if I can get it down there. Maybe you can see it, see how that, see how that hangs hangs off there. So all I've done is I tie an overhand loop in the main line, and that's, a, that's about 20 centimetres. That, and so that's a paternoster, we call it a fixed paternoster link. So that's double, that line there is double, and you can just thread that through either a link swivel or straight onto your bomb. So very simple. And then, then you'd have your, a little loop there where you put your, where you can put your, your hook length. And, and a real long hook length. And you can cast all day with that fixed pattern ostrich. It's very, very light and not get any tangles. That's how I would have fished then. And a, but a big long tail, five or six foot tail. And it's only, don't forget, it's only sort of four or five foot deep, probably four, four and a half foot deep. So I reckon I was on a six foot tail, something like that. And two, two, usually I used to fish two floating maggots and then just fire out this ground bait with cast is similar to what I'd done at layer pits. So I knew exactly how to fish, but you weren't going out so far. So I find that the best way when you're feeding, if you want to get a lot of feed into, into ground bait, you need the ground bait to be like, not sloppy so you can't fire it, but very wet, if you, if you could imagine it. So it's a real wet ball in your hand. And then, then you can get loads of casters and, and a few pinkies in it. I didn't used to put, I didn't put big maggots in, just, just casters and, and pinkies. And then you can fire that out. When it hits the surface, you get that explosion. So everything's, a few pinkies and a few sinking casters are dropping down through the water. And a lot of your casters are floating on top. Now what they do, if you've got any movement on the water, any wind or anything, then them casters float off. Now, anglers nearby will benefit a bit from it, but those carp, will always come to the source of the feed. So yeah, some anglers, a bit of your bait will go into other anglers' pegs and they'll benefit, but eventually, most of them, the feeding ones will end. If you're doing it the best, they'll end up in your peg. It's like feeding a flowing river, really, except with casters, when it's windy, they will flow a long way. That's why I like to be in the middle of the lake if I was fishing, but I'll tell you a little bit about that in a, in a minute, a bit about the draw, but that's how, that's how I would, I would fish for 11 foot rod and and you just fish a, a little half half ounce bomb throw out and don't clip up your line at all you'd have your rod set at an angle put your rod in the rest set at an angle the back wind off no back wind on clutch still set fairly fairly well so you when you pick your rod up your clutch and you could back wind as well if you hit a fish only on a 22 hook pound bottom so you've got to be careful they weren't big carp there, they, they were fairy between like a pound, I suppose three pound would have been a big one, but a lot of sort of pound, pound and a, and a bit fish. And anyway, match day comes. I've told you how, 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 how to fish it. And the, the match, and I was confident. I really knew how to catch these fish. And, and that I had this, this was the only time I got an advantage over perhaps the Barnsley anglers. And, and, the, and the, the Trent anglers, I knew how to catch these carp. I told, I told Wayne exactly how to fish for them. Didn't even hesitate to tell him. I thought he's, he's just, and we've been like that ever since. Told him exactly what to do. I told Kevin what to do, how to fish for them. But uh, Kevin didn't, I don't think Kevin took quite so much notice. Kevin loves fishing casters, so I think he fished caster on a day. He's still done okay, but he lost a few fish. You have to really be careful on fish handling with these carp. And I've learned how to do it at layer. Just take your time, let them run. But the match day come and it was, well, it was, it wasn't anything like I'd normally fish. There wasn't hardly any wind. Well, there wasn't any wind. It was, and it was one of those cold, damp, miserable summer days, if, it, if it's possible. Really, 
very low cloud, overcast, perhaps it'd come in from the sea a little bit because we're very close. Southampton's right on the south coast, so we were, you know, only a few, probably a couple of miles off the sea. And, and I drew down the far end of this lake, which wasn't the best of areas, but I wasn't really worried. I started, the match starts, and I started feeding just these small balls. Load, and I know I did feed a lot even that day. I bet I fed four or five pints of floating casters, a few sinkers in there as well, and some pinkies. So I fed a load of a load of feeds to leave, even though it's hard and anyway. The match starts and I'm firing out, and, you know, little bombs going out. I think oh, it was cold and I couldn't see many couldn't see many fish being caught. And so I thought, hmm. After about 20 minutes, I thought, no, I've not had a any signs yet so I put I thought I wonder if these and I hadn't seen many signs of fish on top at that time they came later and I so I put three pinkies on the hook now pink is a lovely soft bait so if it's difficult pink is the softest of all the maggots and that's usually good for the hook and in the summer it still doesn't shrink up it wasn't cold but the fish were down on the bottom and I put three pinkies on and out I went just just went to feed and the tip goes round I'm into my first carp and I carried on like that, really. I carried on for, for most of the match, still still with a big long tail. Don't you don't worry, just casting out, big long tail, three pinkies on a on a twenty. And I ended up winning the section with uh thirty one pound. Not only did I win the section, I won the match from not a good area really, but I just knew how to catch and I knew how not to lose fish. I'd lost I lost two fish. So I only had £31, but some of them were small, so quite a few fish. You still have to wait for your bites, of course. And uh, Stan Peacher was second. Stan Peacher, another great angler from Leicester. He had £30. I only just beat Stan, but he was in another section. He was in the middle of the lake, where I would have expected you should have won from. I probably told Stan roughly what to do, knowing me, because he used to write a lot of stuff for me back in those days. So I'd, so then I'd won the match. I'd been on the with them, had a second, came back to this HMS Dryad, won the match. Uh, now I'd got two section wins. Hey, and there's five grand up for the winner. And now I'm getting excited. Oh, yes. I'm definitely getting excited. And we move on to uh, the, the next venue was Carmel Dam, which I didn't really know. Didn't really know Carmel, which is in the northwest. That, that was Kevin's area. He did know it, and he did tell me how to fish it. He told me roughly what to do with the tip. There was a little bit of tip, bit of waggler. But, I mean, on my strength was the pole then. A strength over other anglers, because the pole had come in when I was just, you know, other anglers were fishing wagglers and stick floats, but I was on equal terms with everybody on the pole because I'd done as much of pole fishing as anybody else. So I felt confident in using the pole and I drew somewhere along somewhere along the roadside stretch. It was about six, seven foot deep, but uh, quite a fair section. It was, um, yeah, six or seven foot deep. Uh, and it seemed to me to be a very even section. And I started off, I thought, well, I'm gonna fish the pole again. I John Allen the next to me. I forget I had on the other side, but John was on my left. And the match match starts. I thought, well, I'm I'm not going to fish tip. I thought if I fish tip, I'm taking a chance. I'm going to try and catch. Kevin had told me about catching these skimmers with squats. He said it'd be hard. He said, but you'll you you know you'll catch. So I fed fishing about ten meters a game. We you couldn't fish the poles then. You don't. We wouldn't think about it. If you got a twelve meter pole then in eighty six, it was. A fair bit to handle it. Not that easy. You couldn't, you couldn't cup in because you didn't have cups. If you throw in your bait, and I wanted to throw soft, sloppy bait, ten meters was about max. To ch chuck sloppy bait, twelve meters gets it's hard. So I set it on about ten. Mate, I might have fished a little bit further. I don't know, but but not much further. And John's on, John's on tip and waggler. And I'm on, and we we had quite a good match. I was feeding these soft balls. If you, if, if with skimmers and bream, if you can feed soft cloud, they love it. 
They love coming into cloud. And then if you've got a few squats just dripping out of it as well, that's just ex extra sort of attraction. Don't worry that the bait has to go on the bottom. Don't think that skimmers are always going to be there on the bottom. Skimmers love to come up in the water and they will and bream and they will come into a cloud. So don't worry about feeding like that. I was throwing these soft balls in with a few squats, not too many. I bet I was on a 22 hook, probably a half gram rig, something fairly light. And looking at those lines I was using, catching those eels, I was probably on 06 and 09 main line. I'd fish a bit heavier these days. And I was catching the, I can remember catching these just small skimmers. They weren't so big. And I ended up with just over five pounds, two and a half kilo, perhaps a little bit more. But John just beat me. He, um, he, but he only beat me by sort of 40, 50 grams, a couple of ounces, not not much. Uh, but So I, I, I got a second in sections. I had two firsts and a second. And, but we're still doing well. I was still winning with, you know, the maximum you could have got was three points anyway. And I'd got four and that was winning it. And just two points behind me on six points was Richard Clegg. You know, if, I mean, if he hadn't have, I think if he hadn't have sort of gone into being a manager, an England team manager, he, he would have been in the England team. I think he'd have been a brilliant, there's, there's Richard. I've got one, I've got one of Richard with a fish, look. Yeah. That, that's my hero, Richard Clegg, OBE now, with a bream. Uh, brilliant angler and a brilliant manager, wasn't he? So he was just two points behind me, and, and the last the last venue was Home Pier Point. Not Home Pier Point. What am I saying? Home Pier Point. Well, near Home Pier Point. It was Nottingham. It was the steps, which were it, it's it's called the the steps or the embankment. There's a right through the centre of Nottingham. There's a concrete steps all the way through for. I mean, it's a brilliant match venue, so comfortable. You could just walk down these, and the steps go all the way along. What it is, really, it's a wall, but it's built with steps. So it just goes down, lovely dead flat. Put your box down, easy to get. You park your car right behind your peg all the way through. Yeah, the steps at Nottingham. That's now, and I'm up against all the Barnsley anglers, all the Nottingham anglers. I'm up against everybody, the who's, who's who of match fishing, except me, of course. And uh, I bet they're all thinking, oh, he's going to fail. Oh, Nuddy's going to fail today. He won't, he won't do any good. Um, but I thought I'd stick to my pole. I thought, well, I'm going to stick to my pole. That's what I've done. Everybody's saying it's stick, float and waggler. That's the only way you can win. You can't, you know, there's no other way of doing it. Can't win on pole. Impossible. And uh, so, and it was a bit awkward for pole fishing because you've got these steps behind you, so you couldn't, you didn't have any, there was no flat rollers in those days. You had V rollers and that's dangerous when you've got, when you're surrounded by concrete. If the wind blows and your pole blows off, off the roller. I, I would have laid my rod hold all down knowing me, I should think. Keep it safe. So uh, initially, initial feed, I would have, I think I'd put in, I put fed soft again. It was, a, it was quite deep, probably nine foot deep. So two metres deep. I fed about... I think I put eight soft, but not rock hard balls. Sort of, once again, if you want to attract fish, just when you, even when you're balling in, no cups, remember, so you're throwing your ground bait. When you're balling in, don't worry if it just make a cloud. Don't worry, it wasn't flowing that hard and it's drifting down. So even though the, as, you, as the bait hits the water, as your ground bait hits the water and it floats, it will draw fish, that's exactly what you want. You don't have to drop a, a rock hard ball straight down to the bottom. You want I wanted to catch everything. I wanted to catch gudgeon, whatever there was that everything that swam, I wanted to catch as quick as I could. So uh the match starts and I'm putting these seven or eight balls. Softish. Once again, ten meters. That was nice. Ten meters was about a good comfortable distance with the equipment we had. Not a heavy float, I'd have only been on probably three quarters of a gram i've to fish a bit heavier probably these days but about three quarters of a gram fishing just just i was just over depth just letting it run through because it was quite quite clean bottom as long as it's running through all right single maggot single 
bronze maggot on it. Uh, I don't know if I was fished a 22 or a 20. They are quite crafty, those Trent fish. So I reckon I might have been on a 22 then. That's so hard to remember thinking back. Hey, can you imagine think, thinking back 35 years? Huh? So and it, I started catching them and, and, and I, was, I didn't put any more ground back in. I started to loose feed then because that, that is definitely the best way to attract fish if you can. If you can get away with just loose feeding or like I said, that sloppy sort of ground bait, you tend to draw more fish. And I was loose feeding a, a few bronze maggots and a little bit of hemp. hemp. The hemp will go down faster, but will get some bigger fish in your peg. Uh, even though you don't put it on the hook, they still seem to draw good, good quality fish. And I was catching really well. Lots, lots of little gudgeon, roach, dace, everything. I didn't have any big fish, but everything that swam my caught and ended up with six kilo, 12 pound odd. I think just, just over six kilo. And how brilliant but I didn't win my section. I was second in the section. So from that, I'd got two twos and two ones, six points. And Dick won his section and uh, he he was, well, he'd have been on seven points. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he wouldn't have been far behind me. And it was 5,000 pounds to the first prize. So, oh, bonnie, so, um, and now I'd have won. I'd won the, the actual Whitbreads UK Championships with six points. I'd second in my section that day on the train, but I was fifth in the match that day. So I had a first, a second and a fifth. I didn't, I don't know where I came at Carmel, probably 10th, I suppose, something like that, but still did well in, in all the matches. Um, so that was, that was fantastic. And then after um, we went to a pub close by, uh, I don't know, I don't know what the name of it was, but I was in there, um, and and I'd won altogether about seven thousand pounds. You know that is a lot of money, seven thousand pounds. It was then them days. What would it be worth? Twenty thousand now, I should think. Must be. So we got, so we got all this, got all this, um, this money. Went in a. In the, and the bar bill, well, I know, I know, I can remember I bought 11 bottles of champagne that night. 11. I, I drank, I reckon I drank five. And I bet, I think Frank Barlow <laughs> drank five as well. I don't know, we polished off a fair bit. My bar bill was about £250, which would have been, I don't know, seven or 800 these days, I suppose. Maybe a bit more, but a lot of money anyway. And then we ended up on the, right, right on the on the bridge, on Nottingham Bridge, not far from where Frank lived, we ended up in a restaurant there that did the most enormous T-bones. And Frank loved his T-bones, so did I. We've been in there a few times and that's where we ended up. T-bone steaks right on the on Trent Bridge in this restaurant. And that was the end. That was the 1986 Whitbread UK Championships. The winner. Bob Nudd. Unbelievable, really. Against such, I mean, the anglers then were, were they were they were brilliant compared to me. I would I did lack experience then without a doubt, even though I was in the England team. I hope you all enjoyed that little chat. And uh well it won't be long and I'll be on our third programme. So keep in touch. Thank you very much for watching this. Really appreciate it. Hope you've all enjoyed it. Bye for now.